This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com. Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Chapter 3, Part 1. I looked at him, lost in astonishment. There he was before me, in motley, as though he had absconded from a troop of mimes, enthusiastic, fabulous. His very existence was improbable, inexplicable, and altogether bewildering. He was an insoluble problem. It was inconceivable how he had existed, how he had succeeded in getting so far, how he had managed to remain, why he did not instantly disappear. I went a little farther, he said, then still a little farther, till I had gone so far that I don't know how I'll ever get back. Never mind, plenty time, I can manage. You take Kurtz away, quick, quick, I tell you. The glamour of youth enveloped his party-coloured rags, his destitution, his loneliness, the essential desolation of his futile wanderings. For months, for years, his life hadn't been worth a day's purchase, and there he was, gallantly, thoughtlessly alive, to all appearances, indestructible solely by the virtue of his few years and of his unreflecting audacity. I was seduced into something like admiration, like envy. Glamour urged him on. Glamour kept him unscathed. He surely wanted nothing from the wilderness but space to breathe in and to push on through. His need was to exist, and to move onwards at the greatest possible risk, and with a maximum of privation. If the absolutely pure, uncalculating, unpractical spirit of adventure had ever ruled a human being, it ruled this bepatched youth. I almost envied him the possession of this modest and clear flame. It seemed to have consumed all thought of self so completely that even while he was talking to you, you forgot that it was he, the man before your eyes, who had gone through these things. I did not envy him his devotion to Kurtz, though. He had not meditated over it. It came to him, and he accepted it with a sort of eager fatalism. I must say that to me it appeared about the most dangerous thing in every way he had come upon so far. They had come together unavoidably, like two ships becalmed near each other, and lay rubbing sides at last. I suppose Kurtz wanted an audience, because on a certain occasion, when encamped in the forest, they had talked all night, or more probably Kurtz had talked. "'We talked of everything,' he said, quite transported at the recollection. "'I forgot there was such a thing as sleep. The night did not seem to last an hour. Everything! Everything!' Of love, too. Ah, he talked to you of love, I said, much amused. It isn't what you think, he cried, almost passionately. It was in general. He made me see things. Things! He threw his arms up. We were on deck at the time, and the headman of my woodcutters, lounging nearby, turned upon him his heavy and glittering eyes. I looked around, and I don't know why, but I assure you that never, never before did this land— this river, this jungle, the very art of this blazing sky appear to me so hopeless and so dark, so impenetrable to human thought, so pitiless to human weakness. And ever since you have been with him, of course, I said. On the contrary, it appears their intercourse had been very much broken by various causes. He had, as he informed me proudly, managed to nurse Kurtz through two illnesses— he alluded to it as you would to some risky feat, but as a rule Kurtz wandered alone far in the depths of the forest. Very often coming to this station I had to wait days and days before he would turn up, he said. Ah, uh, it was worth waiting for, sometimes. What was he doing, exploring or what? I asked. Oh, yes, of course. He had discovered lots of villages, a lake, too. He did not know exactly in what direction, it was dangerous to inquire too much, but mostly his expeditions had been for ivory. But he had no goods to trade with by that time, I objected. 
"'There's a good lot of cartridges left even yet,' he answered, looking away. "'To speak plainly, he raided the country,' I said. He nodded. "'Not alone, surely?' He muttered something about the villages round that lake. "'Kurtz got the tribe to follow him, did he?' I suggested. He fitted it a little. "'They adored him,' he said. The tone of these words was so extraordinary that I looked at him searchingly. It was curious to see his mingled eagerness and reluctance to speak of Kurtz. The man filled his life, occupied his thoughts, swayed his emotions. "'What can you expect?' he burst out. He came to them with thunder and lightning, you know, and they had never seen anything like it, and very terrible. He could be very terrible. You can't judge Mr. Kurtz as you would an ordinary man. No, no, no. Now, just to give you an idea, I don't mind telling you, he wanted to shoot me, too, one day. But I don't judge him. Shoot you? I cried. What for? Well, I had a small lot of ivory the chief of that village near my house gave me. You see, I used to shoot game for them. Well, he wanted it and wouldn't hear reason. He declared he would shoot me unless I gave him the ivory, and then cleared out of the country because he could do so, and had a fancy for it, and there was nothing on earth to prevent him killing whom he jolly well pleased. And it was true, too. I gave him the ivory. What did I care? But I didn't clear out. No, no. I couldn't leave him. I had to be careful, of course, till we got friendly again for a time. He had his second illness then. Afterwards I had to keep out of the way, but I didn't mind. He was living for the most part in those villages on the lake. When he came down to the river, sometimes he would take to me, and sometimes it was better for me to be careful. This man suffered too much. He hated all this, and somehow he couldn't get away. When I had a chance I begged him to try and leave while there was time. I offered to go back with him, and he would say yes, and then he would remain, go off on another ivory hunt, disappear for weeks, forget himself amongst these people, forget himself, you know. Why, he's mad, I said. He protested indignantly. Mr. Kurtz couldn't be mad. If I had heard him talk only two days ago, I wouldn't dare hint at such a thing. I had taken up my binoculars while we talked and was looking at the shore, sweeping the limit of the forest at each side and at the back of the house. The consciousness of there being people in that bush, so silent, so quiet, as silent and quiet as the ruined house on the hill, made me uneasy. There was no sign on the face of nature of this amazing tale that was not so much told as suggested to me in desolate exclamations, completely by shrugs, in interrupted phrases in hints ending in deep sighs. The woods were unmoved, like a mask, heavy like the closed door of a prison. They looked with their air of hidden knowledge, of patient expectation, of unapproachable silence. The Russian was explaining to me that it was only lately that Mr. Kurtz had come down to the river, bringing along with him all the fighting men of that lake tribe. He had been absent for several months, getting himself adored, I suppose, and had come down unexpectedly with the intention to all appearance of making a raid either across the river or downstream. Evidently the appetite for more ivory had got the better of the, what shall I say, less material aspirations. However, he had got much worse suddenly. I heard he was lying helpless, and so I came up, took my chance, said the Russian. Oh, he is bad, very bad. I directed my glass to the house. There were no signs of life, but there was the ruined roof, the long mud wall peeping above the grass, with three little square window holes, no two of the same size. All this brought within reach of my hand, as it were. And then I made a brusque movement, and one of the remaining posts of that vanished fence leapt up in the field of my glass. You remember I told you I had been struck at that distance by certain attempts at ornamentation, rather remarkable in the ruinous aspect of the place. Now I had suddenly the nearer view, and its first result was to make me throw my head back as if before a blow. Then I went carefully from post to post with my glass, and I saw my mistake. These round knobs were not ornamental but symbolic. They were expressive and puzzling, striking and disturbing, 
food for thought, and also for vultures if there be any looking down from the sky, but at all events for such ants as were industrious enough to ascend the pole. They would have been even more impressive, those heads on the stakes, if their faces had not been turned to the house. Only one, the first I had made out, was facing my way. I was not so shocked as you may think. The start back I had given was really nothing but a movement of surprise. I had expected to see a knob of wood there, you know. I returned deliberately to the first I had seen, and there it was, black, dried, sunken, with closed eyelids, a head that seemed to sleep at the top of the pole, and, with the shrunken dry lips showing a narrow white line of the teeth, was smiling too smiling continuously at some endless and jocose dream of that eternal slumber. I am not disclosing any trade secrets. In fact, the manager said afterwards that Mr. Kurtz's methods had ruined the district. I have no opinion on that point, but I want you clearly to understand that there was nothing exactly profitable in these heads being there. They only showed that Mr. Kurtz lacked restraint in the gratification of his various lusts, that there was something wanting in him, some small matter which, when the pressing need arose, could not be found under his magnificent eloquence. Whether he knew of this deficiency himself, I can't say. I think the knowledge came to him at last, only at the very last. But the wilderness had found him out early, and had taken on him a terrible vengeance for the fantastic invasion. I think it had whispered to him things about himself which he did not know things of which he had no conception till he took counsel with this great solitude, and the whisper had proved irresistibly fascinating. It echoed loudly within him because he was hollow at the core. I put down the glass, and the head that had appeared near enough to be spoken to seemed at once to have leapt away from me into inaccessible distance. The admirer of Mr. Kurtz was a bit crestfallen. In a hurried, indistinct voice he began to assure me he had dared not to take these, say, symbols down. He was not afraid of the natives. They would not stir till Mr. Kurtz gave the word. His ascendancy was extraordinary. The camps of these people surrounded the place, and the chiefs came every day to see him. They would crawl. I don't want to know anything of the ceremonies used when approaching Mr. Kurtz, I shouted. Curious, this feeling that came over me, that such details would be more intolerable than those heads drying on the stakes under Mr. Kurtz's windows. After all, that was only a savage sight, while I seemed at one bound to have been transported into some lightless region of subtle horrors, where pure, uncomplicated savagery was a positive relief, being something that had a right to exist, obviously, in the sunshine. The young man looked at me with surprise. I suppose it did not occur to him that Mr. Kurtz was no idol of mine. He forgot I hadn't heard any of these splendid monologues on, what was it, on love, justice, conduct of life, or what not. If it had come to crawling before Mr. Kurtz, he crawled as much as the veriest savage of them all. I had no idea of the conditions, he said. These heads were the heads of rebels. I shocked him excessively by laughing. Rebels! What would be the next definition I was to hear? There had been enemies, criminals, workers, and these were rebels. Those rebellious heads looked very subdued to me on their sticks. You don't know how such a life tries a man like Kurtz, cried Kurtz's last disciple. Well, and you? I said. I, I, I am a simple man. I have no great thoughts. I want nothing from anybody. How can you compare me to— his feelings were too much for speech, and suddenly he broke down. "'I don't understand,' he groaned. "'I've been doing my best to keep him alive, and that's enough. I had no hand in all this. I have no abilities. "'There hasn't been a drop of medicine or a mouthful of invalid food for months here. He was shamefully abandoned. A man like this, with such ideas. Shamefully, shamefully. I—' I haven't slept for the last ten nights. His voice lost itself in the calm of the evening. The long shadows of the forest had slipped downhill while we talked, had gone far beyond the ruined hovel, beyond the symbolic row of the stakes. 
All this was in the gloom, while we down there were yet in the sunshine, and the stretch of the river abreast of the clearing glittered in a still and dazzling splendor, with a murky and overshadowed bend above and below. Not a living soul was seen on the shore. The bushes did not rustle. Suddenly, round the corner of the house, a group of men appeared, as though they had come up from the ground. They waded waist-deep in the grass, in a compact body bearing an improvised stretcher in their midst. Instantly, in the emptiness of the landscape, a cry arose whose shrillness pierced the still air like a sharp arrow flying straight to the very heart of the land, and, as if by enchantment, streams of human beings, of naked human beings, with spears in their hands, with bows, with shields, with wild glances and savage movements, were poured into the clearing by the dark-faced and pensive forest. The bushes shook, the grass swayed for a time, and then everybody stood still in attentive immobility. "'Now, if he does not say the right thing to them, we are all done for,' said the Russian at my elbow. The knot of men with the stretcher had stopped, too, halfway to the steamer, as if petrified. I saw the man on the stretcher sit up, lank with an uplifted arm, above the shoulders of the bearers. Let us hope that the man who can talk so well of love in general will find some particular reason to spare us this time, I said. I resented bitterly the absurd danger of our situation, as if to be at the mercy of that atrocious phantom had been a dishonoring necessity. I could not hear a sound, but through my glasses I saw the thin arm extended commandingly, the lower jaw moving, the eyes of that apparition shining darkly far in its bony head that nodded with grotesque jerks. Kurtz. Kurtz. That means short in German, don't it? Well, the name was as true as everything else in his life, and death. He looked at least seven feet long. His covering had fallen off, and his body emerged from it pitiful and appalling as from a winding-sheet. I could see the cage of his ribs all astir, the bones of his arm waving. It was as though an animated image of death carved out of old ivory had been shaking its hand with menaces at a motionless crowd of men made of dark and glittering bronze. I saw him open his mouth wide. It gave him a weirdly voracious aspect, as though he had wanted to swallow all the air, all the earth, all the men before him. A deep voice suddenly reached me faintly. He must have been shouting. He fell back suddenly. The stretcher shook as the bearers staggered forward again, and almost at the same time I noticed that the crowd of savages was vanishing without any perceptible movement of retreat, as if the forest that had ejected these beings so suddenly had drawn them in again as the breath is drawn in a long aspiration. Some of the pilgrims behind the stretcher carried his arms, two shotguns, a heavy rifle, and a light revolver carbine, the thunderbolts of that pitiful Jupiter. The manager bent over him, murmuring as he walked beside his head. They laid him down in one of the little cabins, just a room for a bed-place and a camp-stool or two, you know. We had brought his belated correspondence, and a lot of torn envelopes and open letters littered his bed. His hand roamed feebly amongst these papers. I was struck by the fire of his eyes, and the composed languor of his expression. It was not so much the exhaustion of disease. He did not seem in pain. This shadow looked satiated and calm, as though for the moment it had had its fill of all the emotions. He rustled one of the letters, and looking straight in my face, said, I am glad. Somebody had been writing to him about me. These special recommendations were turning up again. The volume of tone he emitted without effort, almost without the trouble of moving his lips, amazed me. A voice! A voice! It was grave, profound, vibrating, while the man did not seem capable of a whisper. However, he had enough strength in him, factitious, no doubt, to very nearly make an end of us, as you shall hear directly. The manager appeared silently in the doorway. I stepped out at once, and he drew the curtain after me. The Russian, eyed curiously by the pilgrims, was staring at the shore. I followed the direction of his glance. Dark human shapes could be made out in the darkness, flitting indistinctly against the gloomy border of the forest. 
and near the river two bronze figures, leaning on tall spears, stood in the sunlight under fantastic headdresses of spotted skins, warlike and still in statuesque repose, and from right to left along the lighted shore moved a wild and gorgeous apparition of a woman. She walked with measured steps, draped in striped and fringed cloths, treading the earth proudly with a slight jingle and flash of barbarous ornaments. She carried her head high, her hair was done in the shape of a helmet. She had brass leggings to the knee, brass wire gauntlets to the elbow, a crimson spot on her tawny cheek, innumerable necklaces of glass beads on her neck, bizarre things, charms, gifts of witch-men that hung about her, glittered and trembled at every step. She must have had the value of several elephant tusks upon her. She was savage and superb, wild-eyed and magnificent. There was something ominous and stately in her deliberate progress. And in the hush that had fallen suddenly upon the whole sorrowful land, the immense wilderness, the colossal body of the fecund and mysterious life, seemed to look at her, pensive, as though it had been looking at the image of its own tenebrous and passionate soul. She came abreast of the steamer and stood still, and faced us. Her long shadow fell to the water's edge. Her face had a tragic and fierce aspect of wild sorrow and of dumb pain mingled with the fear of some struggling, half-shaped resolve. She stood looking at us without a stir, and like the wilderness itself, with an air of brooding over an inscrutable purpose. A whole minute passed, and then she made a step forward. There was a low jingle, a glint of yellow metal, a sway of fringed draperies, and she stopped as if her heart had failed her. The young fellow by my side growled. The pilgrims murmured at my back. She looked at us all as if her life had depended upon the unswerving steadiness of her glance. Suddenly she opened her bared arms and drew them up, rigid above her head, as though in an uncontrollable desire to touch the sky, and at the same time the swift shadows darted out on the earth, swept around on the river, gathering the steamer into a shadowy embrace. A formidable silence hung over the scene. She turned away slowly, walked on, following the bank, and passed into the bushes to the left. Once only her eyes gleamed back at us in the dusk of the thickets before she disappeared. "'If she had offered to come aboard, I really think I would have tried to shoot her,' said the man of patches nervously. "'I have been risking my life every day for the last fortnight to keep her out of the house. She got in one day and kicked up a row about those miserable rags I picked up in the storeroom to mend my clothes with. I wasn't decent. At least it must have been that, for she talked like a fury to Kurtz for an hour, pointing at me now and then. I don't understand the dialect of this tribe. Luckily for me, I fancy Kurtz felt too ill that day to care, or there would have been mischief. I don't understand. No, it's too much for me. Ah, well, it's all over now. At this moment I heard Kurtz's deep voice behind the curtain. Save me! Save the ivory, you mean! Don't tell me! Save... Me! Why, I've had to save you. You are interrupting my plans now. Sick, sick, not so sick as you would like to believe. Never mind, I'll carry my ideas out yet. I will return. I'll show you what can be done. You, with your little peddling notions, you are interfering with me. I will return. I... The manager came out. He did me the honor to take me under the arm and lead me aside. He is very low, very low, he said. He considered it necessary to sigh, but neglected to be consistently sorrowful. We have done all we could for him, haven't we? But there is no disguising the fact. Mr. Kurtz has done more harm than good to the company. He did not see the time was not ripe for vigorous action. Cautiously, cautiously, that's my principle. We must be cautious yet. The district is closed to us for a time. Deplorable! Upon the whole, the trade will suffer. I don't deny there is a remarkable quantity of ivory, mostly fossil. We must save it at all events. But look how precarious the position is, and why? Because the method is unsound. Do you, said I, looking at the shore, call it unsound method? 
without doubt, he exclaimed hotly, don't you? No method at all, I murmured after a while. Exactly, he exulted. I anticipated this. Shows a complete want of judgment. It is my duty to point it out in the proper quarter. Oh, said I, that fellow, what's his name? The brickmaker will make a readable report for you. He appeared confounded for a moment. It seemed to me I had never breathed an atmosphere so vile, and I turned mentally to Kurtz for relief, positively for relief. Nevertheless, I think Mr. Kurtz is a remarkable man, I said with emphasis. He started, dropped on me a heavy glance, and said very quietly, He was, and turned his back on me. My hour of favor was over. I found myself lumping along with Kurtz as a partisan of methods for which the time was not ripe. I was unsound, ah, uh, but it was something to have at least a choice of nightmares. I had turned to the wilderness really, not to Mr. Kurtz, who, I was ready to admit, was as good as buried. And for a moment it seemed to me as if I also were buried in a vast grave full of unspeakable secrets. I felt an intolerable weight oppressing my breast the smell of the damp earth, the unseen presence of victorious corruption, the darkness of an impenetrable night. The Russian tapped me on the shoulder. I heard him mumbling and stammered something about, Brother Seaman, couldn't conceal, knowledge of matters that would affect Mr. Kurtz's reputation. I waited. For him, evidently, Mr. Kurtz was not in his grave. I suspect that for him, Mr. Kurtz was one of the immortals. Well, said I at last, speak out. As it happens, I am Mr. Kurtz's friend, in a way. He stated with a good deal of formality that had we not been of the same profession, he would have kept the matter to himself without regard to consequences. He suspected there was an active ill will towards him on the part of these white men that— You are right, I said, remembering a certain conversation I had overheard. The manager thinks you ought to be hanged. He showed a concern at this intelligence, which amused me at first. "'I had better get out of the way quietly,' he said earnestly. "'I can do no more for Kurtz now, and they would soon find some excuse. What's to stop them? There's a military post three hundred miles from here.' "'Well, upon my word,' said I, "'perhaps you had better go if you have any friends amongst the savages nearby.' "'Plenty,' he said. "'They are simple people, and I want nothing, you know.' He stood, biting his lip. Then, I don't want any harm to happen to these whites here, but of course I was thinking of Mr. Kurtz's reputation. But you are a brother seaman, and— All right, said I, after a time. Mr. Kurtz's reputation is safe with me. I did not know how truly I spoke. He informed me, lowering his voice, that it was Kurtz who had ordered the attack to be made on the steamer. He hated sometimes the idea of being taken away, and then again, but I don't understand these matters, I am a simple man. He thought it would scare you away, that you would give it up, thinking him dead. I could not stop him. Oh, I had an awful time of it this last month. Very well, I said. He is all right now. Yes, he muttered, not very convinced, apparently. Thanks, said I. I shall keep my eyes open. But quiet, eh? he urged anxiously. It would be awful for his reputation if anybody here— I promised a complete discretion with great gravity. I have a canoe and three black fellows waiting not very far. I am off. Could you give me a few Martini Henry cartridges? I could, and did, with proper secrecy. He helped himself with a wink at me to a handful of my tobacco. Between sailors, you know, good English tobacco. At the door of the pilot-house he turned round. "'I say, haven't you a pair of shoes you could spare?' He raised one leg. "'Look!' The soles were tied with knotted strings sandal-wise under his bare feet. I rooted out an old pair at which he looked with admiration before tucking it under his left arm. One of his pockets, bright red, was bulging with cartridges. From the other, dark blue, peeped Towson's inquiry, etc., etc., he seemed to think himself excellently well equipped for a renewed encounter with the wilderness. Ah, I'll never, never meet such a man again. 
you ought to have heard him recite poetry, his own, too, it was, he told me. Poetry! He rolled his eyes at the recollection of these delights. Oh, he enlarged my mind. Goodbye, said I. He shook hands and vanished in the night. Sometimes I ask myself whether I had ever really seen him, whether it was possible to meet such a phenomenon.